Well, I would start by talking about how I got interested in this topic, and it really came about through work that I, I'm primarily a researcher, but I still see patients a day a week and deliver care to inpatient older adults uh, eight weeks out of the year. And my interest in this really stemmed from work we did around barriers to administering opioid therapies or prescribing opioid therapies to older adults. And this work, uh, through this work, I came to understand physicians' fears about side effects that may occur and not be responded to. I also came to understand that physicians were very reluctant to prescribe strong pain medicines like opioids and other medicines to older adults when there was not a caregiver in the home. And in my practice in New York City, most of my patients are widowed or widows or widowers and live alone. And so I recognized right off the bat that these are people who are at risk for not receiving pharmacotherapy because of their social, the, the way they live, I won't say they're socially isolated. But what it says is the physicians are really looking for eyes and ears, a way to monitor patients and to understand whether treatments are having their anticipated benefits or perhaps um, leading to unanticipated and unwanted uh, side effects. So that led to a series of work around receptivity to the use of these devices in, in uh, both patients and providers. And let me just describe what we're talking about. So, the smartphone technology has been rapidly emerging, but these tools are now available and really are there and can collect uh, large amounts of data, both by virtue of the fact of prompting an adult, a patient, to enter in information. So imagine your smartphone being in your hand and you receiving a text, it's time now for you to enter your pain and your mood scores. Um, so there, we think about the ways data can be collected actively where patients have to input information into a phone or it may be a tablet or it may be passively so that the information is already being collected and a person doesn't have to do anything and this can happen by way of GPS tracking, accelerometry where amount of activity over a given day, amount of time spent in a sedentary state, amount of time spent in bed, all of which can be quantified. All of this information can already be transmitted electronically via the internet to either a provider uh, or a loved one. Imagine an 80-year-old who uh, is uh, generating this information and, and, and this information this gets transmitted to the 60-year-old child living in San Francisco. Um, these devices also have the ability now to uh, synthesize and analyze these results. So imagine collecting pain data over the course or activity level data over the course of a week or weeks or a month and displaying these data and having the data be fed back to the person so that they can understand over a, a defined period of time how things have been. Um, as I mentioned, the devices can be used to convey information, and so in the form of applications, and now there are about 44,000 uh, health-related applications out on the market, uh, a substantial proportion are there to, to, in an effort to improve pain and pain outcomes in people who suffer from pain. Um, they can be the source of education about the use of specific techniques, such as uh, exercise, as yoga, as relaxation. So the devices can, can really be thought of as ways to deliver interventions, to monitor for treatment outcomes, to establish the baseline against which we would understand whether our treatments are improving outcomes or perhaps making them go in the other direction. Um, I think the prompts that uh, people can relieve can also reinforce treatment adherence. So there are really a ton of theoretical advantages to the use of the tools. I mentioned that some of the work that our group has done is looked at receptivity. So often what we hear is that older adults, by virtue of their age, are not going to adopt the use of the tools. And what our research suggests is quite the opposite, that they're very receptive to the use of the tools. What they say to us are things like, well, we're going to need to be trained. Don't expect us just to adopt instantaneously. 
Uh, we've also heard in focus group work that it will be important to use devices that are functionally appropriate. So imagine the older adult with arthritis or visual problems that may have a difficult time reading a small screen. So the, the devices and the tools that we hope to bring into practice need to be appropriate, functionally appropriate uh, for our older patients in particular. But our work suggests that older adults are willing to try them. Our work also indicates that providers are willing to think about using these tools on a routine basis in practice. But obviously there are barriers. And from the provider perspective, the barriers are things like, well, am I going to get reimbursed for uh, processing information that comes to me out of the context of a clinical visit? Right now, we've got to see patients face-to-face -face in order to get, uh, to get the billing for that. Uh, they worry about liability issues. So if a bad event happens and we are on record as monitoring people, am I liable for an adverse event? Um, and I think uh, patient, uh, physicians in particular also voice concern, at least our research suggests this, that there is the possibility that too much information can be coming because these devices literally can collect lots and lots of data. And the last thing physicians want is just a ton of data coming at them. What they really want are small bits of information th that I would characterize as perhaps red flags you know, things that they absolutely should be responding to. Otherwise, it's going to be too much work. Uh, I mentioned the facilitators uh, from the patient side. I think the barriers uh, I mentioned again is, are the devices going to be usable? Um, patients worry less in our studies about uh, privacy, issues, privacy issues. People have raised that as a concern. You know, what about the loss of privacy in using these tools? Uh, most of the older adults that we've interviewed in our studies suggest that in fact they like that oversight, that it provides some reassurance. My thinking is it is not when these devices come in, it, not if these devices come into practice, it, it is when. I think they are coming and, and I think um, we've got to be smart and think about the, the, the appropriate use of the tools. But in my own mind, uh, I have every reason to believe that the devices will play an important role in helping us to understand whether our treatments are having the intended effect. And uh, the hope is that they will be able to identify people who are trending towards a negative health event. So imagine an example would be a person who might be experiencing a little bit of constipation from an opioid and the last thing that we want to do is, is have that person get to an obstipated state where they can't pass stool at all. These devices have the ability to perhaps pick up through sentinel events early on warning signs that would alert clinicians to something much worse in the future and intervening earlier to prevent that unwanted event. So I'm optimistic. Uh, there are issues that have to be worked out, as I mentioned, in terms of reimbursement, policy issues. Um, but I think the tools are going to be a useful adjunct to the way we deliver care in general and pain care in specific. You know, it might be, and certainly, you know, one of the advantages that I think the tools will provide is uh, the in-the-moment responses. If we on the provider side can uh, create a system to respond to those, um, and, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, people will have pain flares. Uh, imagine a person, you know, pain doesn't stay constant. If you've got a person with chronic pain, they, uh, there may be a flare. And it, it, that's the point in time where they need advice and consultation. And these devices have the ability to uh, help clinicians intervene at these appropriate times. You know, the point about uh, cultural amenability is, is an interesting one. Um, in the work that I do, I'm often reminded how important it is to be mindful of cultural differences and how people not only report pain, but think about the ways uh, that are appropriate to manage pain in a culture, the ways uh, that may or may not be appropriate in a culture to uh, get help from family members in a greater, a broader social network. So I think the tools may be able to provide some benefit. I failed to mention, thank you for this comment and the question that I, I think another dividend for the use of these devices that's been talked about, less demonstrated today, is the ability to, to, to form social networks. 
Um, and certainly we know that pain isolates people. So the extent to which uh, people use these tools to establish and, and enhance socialization, I think would be a very positive thing.